In this video, we are going to look at the variants of Turing machines. In the last video, we uh, defined a Turing machine as a finite control plus a one-sided unbounded tape memory. So today we're going to look at different kinds of uh, uh, Turing machines with uh, various types of tapes as memories. Okay, so uh, we also, in addition to deterministic Turing machines, we're also going to look at non-deterministic Turing machines. Okay, so uh, for deterministic Turing machines, we are going to use DTM to represent it. So now our question here, our first question is, is a single one-sided unbounded tape sufficient in terms of computability, in terms of studying computability? To answer these questions, uh, we will look at variants of Turing machines, including multiple Turing machines or multiple tape, sorry, multiple tape Turing machines and non-deterministic Turing machines. We may also look at two-sided tapes and multi-dimensional tapes. Okay, so when we say multi-tape Turing machines, we are still thinking about uh, one-sided unbounded tapes. Uh, the only difference here is that we have more than one one-sided uh, unbounded tapes. But then of course, we can also look at two-sided tapes and also uh, multi-dimensional tapes, such as uh, two-dimensional tapes or three-dimensional tapes and so on. So the second question is that do deterministic Turing machines, and uh, we use NTMs to represent non-deterministic Turing machines. So we want to know whether non-deterministic Turing machines increase computing power. In other words, will non-deterministic Turing machine accept languages that cannot be accepted by DTMs? So the answer to these, for, uh, to these two questions are, uh, or, or the answer to these two question, questions is the following. All variants of Turing machines are equivalent to Turing machine with one tape in terms of computability. Actually, it should be just R equivalent to deterministic Turing machine in terms of computability. Okay, so maybe I want to say here we want to uh, say this is not uh, this is a deterministic Turing machine. So using Turing machine variants does not increase computing power, but may but may make things easier to describe for a given problem. So then it's, uh, it's sort of like a judgment call. Sometimes uh, when we des describe a Turing machine, sometimes using multi-tape is easier to describe. Sometimes using non-deterministic Turing machine is easier. Okay. Okay, so first look at multi-tape Turing machines. In this particular case, we are thinking of uh, several one-sided unbounded tapes. Okay, so, but uh, it still just has, uh, so this tape, each tape has a rewrite head of its own. Okay, so let me open up a whiteboard. So this is a multi-tape Turing machine looks like this. So we have a finite state control or finite control. And we have a number of one-sided unbounded memories. So let's say we have K of them. Okay, then each tape has its own rewrite head. So it looks like we have this, we may have that. 
Okay. So on the state queue, and you look at the first, uh, look at the, the first tape, look at the second, and so on. And then uh, depending on the state symbol, the tape symbols, then you will move to the next state, P. Okay, so these symbols again, for, uh, for each of these single tape, it just, for each of these tape, it just, it adds like a single tape. So you can move, the read right head can move to the left, can move to the right, and also can replace, a, can write a symbol, replace a symbol, and so on. Okay, so this is a, uh, we call it K-tape, clearing machine. Now let's go back to the slides. Okay, so let's see a formal definition of multi-tape Turing machine. So it is like an ordinary Turing machine with several tapes. Each tape has its own head for reading and writing. Initially, the input appears on tape one. So you can probably, it's, uh, it's, it's more, uh, it makes more sense to think about uh, the, the first tape as an input tape and an output tape. Sometimes you can designate an output tape also. So, and the other, then the other tapes are going to be as uh, working tapes and the other tapes at the beginning start out blank because they are working tapes, okay? Be before the computation begins, uh, there shouldn't be anything on the other tapes. The transition function is changed to allow for reading, writing, and moving the heads on some of some or all of the tapes simultaneously. Formally, the transition function then is like this. So on a state and then on a K symbols, because we're talking about K tape uh, theory machines. Oh, by the way, so this is, again, if it's not, is, if it's a halting state, then we don't have a transition because it halts. So that should be, uh, so this Q should be replaced by Q minus QA, QR. So, and then you go to a new state and then you could write new symbols and you could move to the left, move to the right, or uh, stationary. So which means that, uh, uh, it doesn't move. So some of these tapes don't move. Okay. So for instance, this expression uh, delta a one on. So this so this so so this just means that uh, at the beginning, sorry, uh, at state q i, the first tape, okay, points to a one. The K state points to AK. Okay. And then it moves to QJ and A1 becomes B1. Of course, it could still be the same. Uh, B2 becomes, uh, A2 becomes B2. Of course, they could also be the same. All right. So this is uh, just a easy extension of one tape to a machine. All right, so this is what it looks like. Okay, so uh, on top of it is a three tape Turing machine. And then we're going to, we're going to show that um, any mo multiple tape Turing machines can be simulated by a single tape Turing machine. Okay. All right, so uh, the proof is straightforward, so we just use, okay, so maybe I will open up a whiteboard. So uh, you have tape, you have K tape. Let's say this is, Tape tape. So this is M. Okay. 
Uh, and then I'm going to use a single tape machine to simulate it. So basically, I am going to uh, divide it, divide a single tape into k portions. Okay, so this is the first portion, the second, and the k's. So then I'm going to put the configuration of the first tape here. Uh, so for instance, uh, the, the head, the, uh, the location of the heads, right? So, so which could be just, uh, for instance, uh, you got X and you got A and that's the head location and then separated by a pound sign, right? So each of these is separated by a pound sign. So first portion and separated by the pound sign. Okay, and then the second tape, the configuration will be here and the case tape will be here. So for each move of M, uh, what they do here is that for each tape, they're going to change. Then of course, for my single tape machine, you will go, okay, from here, I will change that. So if, for instance, if it's on the boundary, you're going to move to the right, then what you do is it will shift everything here to the right, right? So, which is doable, it just takes much more time to do it. Okay, so, uh, and also, if we want to go to left on the boundary, you are not supposed to. So that means that we can use a single tape to simulate K tapes. Okay, so here this dot indicates the head location. So this is the first tape. The second tape is the third tape. Okay, so for instance, uh, the head location of the first tape is on this one. So now, now I indicate that the head location for this first tape is on one, and here is on the third A. So that's what we have here. Here's on the first B. So that's what we have here. Okay, so for, for each move of M, uh, you will do a lot of moves on S, but nevertheless, it's doable. It just takes more time. Okay, so then other deterministic variants include uh, a DTM with multiple tapes and a single head. Okay, so, uh, so there's only one head, of course, that is obviously equivalent to a theory machine with a single one-sided tape. And a DTM with a single two-sided tape is equivalent to a theory machine with two one-sided tapes because if you have a two-sided tapes, of course, you can always uh, select a point so that um, this is what's going to be like in the middle and then it looks like two tapes. Okay, so this is like, uh, so this is a tape one, we go this direction. And tape two go into this direction. So that's like that. And then the only thing you need to worry about is that if it's a two dimensional tape, of course you are allowed to cross the boundary. So when that happens, uh, so what you are doing here, so if so when you um, when you use this two tape to simulate these two-sided tapes, now these are one-sided. So if you go to boundary, then whatever, whatever is going to happen will be placed into the second tape. Likewise, if you go to, you want to go to the or go beyond the boundary, then whatever would happen will be happen here. So theoretically, so I mean, it, it can be done. It just takes more time. Uh, uh, then there's uh, two-sided tapes, but in terms of computability, they they accept the same language. 
Okay, so then also uh, if, if you have a uh, two-dimensional tape, it is also equivalent because two-dimensional is just a like that, right? So it's unbounded in all directions and you can always start from somewhere and then you go this way and that is just a single one-sided tape. Right? So that's how you're going to simulate it. Likewise, if you have a k-dimensional tape, it is also equivalent to a Turing machine as long as you figure out a way to traverse a k-dimensional tape uh, as a one-dimensional tape. Okay? So in, in one, uh, uh, in, so I just find a way to traverse it. Okay, so that is not hard to see. We don't need to work out details of it because uh, as, a, as we said, when we describe theory machines, it's sufficient to use English and plus some mathematics to describe how it can be done. Next, we're, not, we're gonna look at non-deterministic theory machines. Okay, so in NTN, NTM and transition function uh, is defined in a uh, normal way. Okay, so in other words, uh, on a given state, on a given tape symbol that the head is pointing to, you have more than one choice to go to the next uh, state. Okay, and uh, different right different symbols, and you move several different choices to move left or to move right. So that means that, um, so, well, this would be, okay, so we have to add this. So then it is just going to a power set, okay? So then the computation is like this. You, so let me open up a uh, whiteboard here. Okay, so for this uh, non-deterministic Turing machine, the computations looks like this, right? So initially, you you start from this configuration, and uh, you may say, I go to Q1, I change the first symbol to A. Okay, so this is the suffix of X. Or maybe the second one is, uh, I, I change A to B. And I go to Q2, or well, the third would be, I didn't do, I didn't do anything but change uh, uh, my state. So, so instead of Q0, I change to Q3, for instance, right? So, so then for each of these configuration, you will have several choices to go down to. Uh, to, for the next configuration. So if I use a circle to represent a uh, configuration, then it will look like this, right? So for each of these, we may have several config choices of the next configurations and so on. And you keep on doing it until at some point, Right, so it's still going at, at some point, I reach a state, which is an accept state. I reach a configuration that includes QA as a, uh, as is a state. So which means that for this path of configuration, it represents an accepting configuration. So that means, uh, we say that this non-deterministic theory machine accepts X as long as there is, there is one uh, sequence of configurations that starts from the initial configuration and ends at a configuration with accepting state, containing accepting state. So this means that, uh, X is accepted by, by an NTN non-deterministic Turing machine. And if 
what is a sequence of configurations. Okay, so this is really a computation path. Okay, such that. So this is a sequence, let's call it C1 up to CK. So such that C1 is the initial configuration and goes to C2, goes to, and goes to, let's say, CM. And CM includes this QA in CM. So then we're saying that uh, X is accepted by this non-deterministic Turing machine. Okay, so now let's move back. Um, okay, so uh, as, so if you look at the uh, computation tree in the in the on the whiteboard we mentioned earlier, let's say. Uh, K is the maximum cardinality of transition, then that tree is a KR, K -ary tree. Okay, each node can have up to K branches or K children. Okay, then, uh, so that, in order to, uh, uh, so of course uh, this uh, non-deterministic theory machine can be simulated by a deterministic theory machine. Okay, so that's the theorem. So every every NTMM can be converted to a DDMM such that they accept the same language. In other words, NTMs are equivalent to DDMs in terms of computability not in terms of efficiency okay so but in terms of what they what they accept so the proof is easy because what we need to do so now let's go back to the whiteboard in order to use a dtm to simulate this computation we just do a breast first search right so we start from the uh, initial configuration, one step, and list all possible configuration, and then we just do layer by layer until the first moment I see, in the layer, I see QA in it, then I stop. So that's what that DTM does. So as you can see, if, the, if this height here is H, and the, this is a K airy tree, then of course uh, this non-deterministic Turing machine will have to execute. Uh, you have to you have to simulate each of these uh, configurations. There are this many configurations. K to the H many configurations. Okay, the depth is H. So in the order of K to the H. So as you can see, in terms of efficiency using deterministic uh, Turing machine to simulate non-deterministic Turing machine will incur exponentially many more steps. Uh, but non-deterministic Turing machine is a convenient way to classify problems, okay? Because uh, later on, we'll, we'll, when we study complexity, time complexity, and we uh, we have, have we have this concept called non-deterministic polynomial time, okay? And deterministic poly, polynomial time in that whether p is equal, whether deterministic polynomial time is equal, uh, 
is the same as non-deterministic polynomial time is a long standing open problem. So we'll, we'll, we'll come to that later. So now let's move. Okay, so now we look at another uh, concept so called emulators. So we can take a different deal on the, on the Turing machine. So this Turing machine, uh, we call it an emulator, which does not take any input and keeps printing strings in L. So, so you have, a, we say L is, uh, we say, so we say a Turing machine M is an em, em, emulator for a partic particular language L. So what, so this M does is that it doesn't take any input. It just keep on running and keep printing string stats in L, right? So it's X1, X2, you just keep on running. If L is infinite, you just keep on running. So, uh, so you operate a little bit and then print out a string. So as long as that string is in L, you print it. So what is emulator really is, is that uh, we, we can make a connection between Turing recognized nizable language and, uh, and a language that can be enumerated by an enumerator. Okay, so there's an emulator by an emulator. So this is not written by an emulator. Okay, so, so here's a proof. Okay, so so suppose L can be uh, enumerated. So there's an E here by an emulator. And uh, emulator. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, the correct name should be enumerator, so not emulator. So let me let me change, make correction here. Okay, so an enumerator, which basically enumerates strings in L. Okay, so then we have that L can be recognized by a Turing machine if and only if L can be enumerated by an enumerator. So here's a proof, okay? So suppose that L can be enumerated, enumerated by an enumerator E. So which means that there is an enumerator E that doesn't take any input, but keeps on printing strings in L. So now, based on this, we're going to construct a Turing, Turing machine as an acceptor or as a recognizer as follows. So this Turing machine E, sorry, this Turing machine will, so we'll construct Turing machine M. So let me put an M here. So this Turing machine M will take input X, right? So M on input, x so what it does is to to run e so so then you run e the e doesn't take any input but i'm just go ahead and run e so when e prints x because it will at a certain moment i don't know when it's going to be but it will print x so when that happens i'm going to accept this m accepts x Okay, so because any x is in l eventually it gets printed so that means that uh, this L is accepted by M. Okay. Now suppose the other direction. So let suppose that L is recognized by a theory machine M. So then for any finite alphabet sigma, let's call it A1, A2 up to AK, sigma star is countably infinite which then can be enumerated by a Turing machine in the lexical graphical order. 
Okay, so you think about this as a alphabet and you list all the strings made up of these symbols in lexical graphical order, so which means you look at the lengths, right? First length starts from zero, zero, one, two, and three. So for each fixed length, you look at all the strings in a dictionary order. So that, that, that means that we can enumerate all strings based on the lengths and then like, uh, okay, so this is empty string and then the lengths of one, lengths of two and so on. So we can list all possible uh, strings over this alphabet. So now we're gonna construct a enumerator E to enumerate strings L. Uh, in L as follows. What it does is that we start from I from one. So we what we do is that we run M. So we run this machine M on X1 up, up to XI. So these so this will be the uh, strings in the lexical graphical order. Um, uh we we so so we 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 have all these strings in the lexical graphical order so we just run m on x1 up to xi for input i so what, what we do is that for i steps okay where x1 up to xi are the first i strings in the lexical graphical order so so each for i steps so that means that so this E will run M on X1 for I steps and then run M on X2 for I steps and so on. Okay, so if M accepts any of these strings, okay, then, e, then print each of the accepting strings. So E then just print it out. And then you increase I by one and then repeat. So then M, uh, on the remaining, okay, so so when when a string has been printed, you removed it. So on the remaining strings, you keep on doing it. Or if you don't mind printing this uh, the elements uh, repeatedly, so you don't even need to remove them. You just keep on doing it. So so this I increase. So next time I'm going to look at i to x i plus one so again i simulate m on these strings each for i plus one steps and any any of those is accepting is accepted then we print it okay so then obviously uh, uh, this e is an enumerator for l so it's, it's pretty straightforward okay so after we saw this, then finally uh, we may uh, we could uh, we are ready to answer the following question. So we have looked at variants of Turing machines, and we also uh, proved that they are equivalent to the most basic Turing machine model, which is a finite control plus a one-sided unbounded memory. They are they are all equivalent, but over the years, uh, since Turing machines was, uh, were devised by Turing, uh, people, well, either before him or after, uh, came up with other computing devices. For instance, uh, Lambda calculus is one of the uh, notable ones. Okay, so they, so, so, uh, they have been all proven. So any of these devices that ever came up either is equivalent to Turing machine in terms of computability. In other words, they accept the same language or they, uh, these devices are not, are not as powerful as Turing machines, meaning that there are some languages that can be accepted by Turing machine but cannot be accepted by the other uh, devices or computation models. Hence, um, we would like to give a statement to summarize these effects. 
uh, but this statement, this statement cannot be proven mathematically because uh, you cannot, because you don't know whether in the future somebody may come up with a different uh, computation models. So it can only be stated as in the form of a thesis. Okay, so this is called church Turing thesis, which says that a function on the natural numbers can be uh, can be calculated by an effective method if and only if it is computable by a Turing machine. Okay, so in other words, any computing devices are either equivalent to Turing machines or uh, not as powerful as Turing machines. So that's called Church Turing thesis, and the uh, Church was Turing's advisor. Okay, so that, so they have the relations. So next, we're, we're going to look at a Hilbert's tense problem. Okay, so Hilbert was a famous mathematician. So uh, uh, over 100 years ago, he raised the following question. Is it decidable whether a polynomial has an integral root? It turns out that this problem is not decidable. Okay, so in other words, uh, we will need to come up with what it means by decidability. And but this problem is recursively enumerable, so we also need a, so this is such so means Turing machine recognizable. Okay, so uh, So of course, if a polynomial has an integral root, then there's an algorithm to find it out. Otherwise, you just keep on running. So may, you may not even, you may, you may never hold the algorithm. So in the next uh, video, we're gonna look at uh, what decidable means. So here, I'm just raising this question. Uh, the last bullet says, uh, so the last bullet says that inputs to a Turing machines are strings, but sometimes you work on different objects such as equations, polynomials, graphs, Turing machines themselves, etc. But they can all be uncoded. Okay, so they can all be uncoded into a, into binary strings, and of course, uh, we can treat binary strings as integers. So that's why in the Turing, in church Turing thesis, the inputs are natural numbers because after encoding, everything can be represented by integers. But these integers, of course, have meanings, right? They, after decoding, then these integers will be converted back to its original objects. Okay, so with that, uh, this is the end of this video.